Koops is awkward, vulnerable, and quite frankly, a dork. And I freaking love him. Let's see how he stacks up against TTYD without Mario's meddling. Can you beat Paper Mario at the Thousand Year Door with only Koops? Let's find out now! Greetings to you! My name is Arantula, and here, we redefine the challenge in challenge running. If this is your first time here and you're a fan of super difficult challenges, subscribe with notifications on and be amazed at the upcoming challenges I have to offer you. Let's talk about Koops right now. Koops is a very ground-oriented character who specializes in sweeping rows of enemies with PowerShell. He's strong, especially when getting into his ultra rank moves like Shell Slam, which ignores defense, and Shell Shield, which extends Mario's longevity, allowing him to survive for longer and keep the fight going. His single point of defense also enables some tactics to work, involving just having the defense to not take damage against certain bosses with good guarding. Despite his many strengths, however, he also has some notable weaknesses. Namely being a Koopa means he can't attack airborne enemies, so we need items to get around that. And with a maximum of 10 items at a time with no strength sack, we're going to need to be very strategic in order to not be left high and dry. There's also his susceptibility to being flipped, rendering him helpless if he gets knocked down, but that's easily remedied by just having good guarding. Most of the time. The rules of this challenge are as follows. Only Koops can be used in battle when we get him. Exception exists for the Iron Clefts and the latter half of Chapter 4. Koops must always be in the front in battle. Aim the Super Guard as few times as you possibly need to. Dropped items after battles are forbidden. I cannot spend money to receive items unless required. This does not apply to badges. No zesty, meaning no items can be cooked. With all that out of the way, it's showtime! Now, in my Pokemon challenges, I just use the Universal Pokemon Randomizer to start with my Pokemon of choice. But in TTYD, it's not practical to start with Koops, especially when he's the second partner you have access to. So instead, this run doesn't officially start until after getting Koops in my party, and it's only then that my rules come into play. If you need a refresher on the rules, I have them in the description along with the music I'll be using throughout the entire video. If also you want to see some social media links, they'll be down there too. Let's continue. Because we can't really target airborne enemies without using items in battle, we often are forced to run from any loadouts of enemies with airborne foes. Now, if I had the courage to super guard, I would. But since Koops gets knocked on his back if he gets struck by any certain moves, and head bonks as well as the swoops that the Paragoombas have are some of those moves, you know, it'd just be extremely risky and not even really worth trying. Especially since this is an RPG where you really don't have to battle enemies if you want to make any progress. This is actually one of the things that I really like about TTYD. Grinding is practically non-existent. For the most part, anyway. In casual runs, it's completely non-existent. In this run, however, that might not necessarily be the case. A rule of thumb, by the way, is that if there are any offensive items like Pow Blocks or Fire Flowers or Thunder Rages, you want to hold on to them for as long as you possibly can until you get to a fight where they're outright required to progress. It wouldn't make very much sense to just spam Thunder Rages on Goombas and then get left high and dry against like Lakitus, right? So then, anyhow, let's talk about the first boss, Hooktail. With no access to shops, you only have access to four mushrooms, which I was hoping would be enough, but over the course of the battle, I soon figured out that it really wouldn't be. And simply put, keep this in mind also, Hooktail is a boss designed their own attack effects are. A badge that makes Hooktail weaker when Mario attacks her while wearing the badge. But because Mario can't attack at all, this super gnarly dragon is a huge threat as the first freaking boss in the game! A bit of trivia about her AI, by the way, is that Hooktail's first two attacks are scripted. The first move she will ever use will always be her Fire Breath, which has an attack power of 4 and hits both Koops and Mario at the same time. And since that move pierces, it doesn't really do Koops any good to have that shell because it's not going to help him here. The second move that she will however use is her Stomp Attack, which has an attack of 5 but doesn't pierce, so it only does 4 damage to Koops. Because of Hooktail's erratic AI, completely dependent on whenever she feels like using Fire Breath, at any point, she can just use Fire Breath 9 times, and that's when Mario dies. My plan for this fight entirely revolved around the badges we have, Mega Rush P, and Last Stand P. We needed for Hookto's AI to cooperate. 
she had to use stomp enough times, whereas Koops would fall on HP, but Mario wouldn't, while also having Koops do damage until he ends up falling into peril after we run out of mushrooms to then knock her out while we're in peril. Why in peril? That's where Mega Rush P comes in. When your partner is in peril, their attack stat increases by a whopping 5. That may not sound like a lot, but in an RPG with numbers this small, it's an incredible difference. Believe me. If you don't, watch this video right here when the video is over. It will show you just exactly how necessary Mega Rush P was to win this fight. Likewise, Last Stand P was also extremely important, as it helped minimize the damage that Hooktail could do to Koops and made it drastically easier to actually fall into peril in the first place to use Mega Rush P. However, at the end of the day, we still didn't have all the resources we needed from the finite pool that we had to pull from. Once we ran out of mushrooms, yes, we did knock Hooktail to 0 HP, but she has a second phase. And by now, we don't have the HP to survive any longer, and we get picked off just like that. We needed more HP recovery, but the only option we had left were the Candy Pops and Paddle Meadows, which can drop infinite horse tails from whacking them with your hammer. With an extra 4 horse tails, and a fight that spans 21 turns, finally we can survive this fight with the resources we have available to us. If only we get lucky still. Remember that Hooktail, if she uses Fire Breath 9 times, one of them being scripted and required to happen, we lose. On an attempt that I got where I would have won, I also had the audience throw a heart at me which threw up my manipulation of my damage, and that I actually thought was going to cost me the fight. But then I was also getting items from the audience like mushrooms and maple syrups, and I decided, okay frick it, the game is giving me items, I'll take it, I'll just take the good luck, let's move on from this fight. This was the first boss by the way, not counting blooper. And this is how hard it was. Look forward to what's coming up later in this video. Chapter 1 is finally over with. Let's move to Chapter 2. With our newfound Power Plus P, a second last stand P from Rogueport Perks from the Lovely House of Badges, and the damage dodge just west of the pipe leading to Boggly Woods, I have everything needed for the next set of bosses coming up. First is the Shadow Sirens. There's no strategy here. Just spend Power Shell with Power Plus P equipped and guard whenever you can. And you can't guard either Vivian's Fiery Jinx or Marilyn's Lightning, but everything else is fair game. I'd use bullet points here, but this fight is so easy, a 7 year old could do it without even playing the game before. There's also a damage dodge P within the Botley Tree, and a ton of star pieces available now thanks to the Super Boost upgrade. Magnus Von Grapple is the second boss of the game, and Magnus, let me just tell you right now, is a far cry from Hooktail. This is a very easy battle if you have a good strategy in play. I have Damage Dodge P for Defense, Power Plus P, and Mega Rush P for Offense as well. And all you have to really do is just keep on the attack and guard almost everything, including the X-Fists. The only thing you have to do from this point forward, along with guarding everything you can, is to not guard just one of the punches that the X-Fists will hit you with. If you do that correctly, you will be able to knock out Magnus without any trouble at all. If you guard everything, however, you will end up not being able to reach peril without using any items, and that would also mean that you potentially will die if you're not properly outfitted. The reason you want to guard the X-Fist and not, say, the Smothering Stomp or the Quake Attack, the X-Fist always attacks the player in front. The Smothering Stomp, you cannot really tell who it's attacking when he chooses to use it, and he can always just choose to only attack Mario, which wouldn't help us at all, whereas the Quake Attack can flip Koops over, so of course you definitely don't want to not guard that. So sure enough, I did in fact have a single death to Magnus, if only because I was just for one time too careful. Once we scrapped that unimpressive fighting robot, I had the dazzle to purchase Flower Saver P and Happy Heart P. I also got Peekaboo and Flower Finder since there really was not much else I cared about buying. Chapter 3 takes us to the floating city of Glitzville. While here, we get some extremely important badges ranging from Mario's copy of Last Stand, and especially Charge P. This badge that we get halfway through Chapter 3 is invaluable for what's coming up later. Its potential will be realized in this very chapter. As far as some fights in the Glitz Pit, I have to admit that a few fights require me to use items to advance because of airborne enemies like Lakitus and Magikoopas. Speaking of Lakitus, here's a question for you. How do you pronounce Lakitu? Do you pronounce it like how I do, or Lakitu? Tell me in the comments down below. While brawling in the Glitz Pit, we also fight Bowser who was random and really not much else. Really, 
I just have to keep Mario safe, and there really was nothing to worry about here at all. He only has 30 HP also, which is no higher than that of Hooktail, basically, when you combine her two phases. And I believe the same with Magnus. So he may not be very threatening here, but trust you me, he becomes a nightmare later in the game. On the contrary, the Koopanator exists, and despite not being a major boss, this guy was freaking tough as nails. Which I guess makes sense, since I really didn't have much of a choice but to not use items during this fight. Not to mention that he has a potentially much higher attack set than Hooktail when he chooses to charge. Which also makes it much more unpredictable to try getting into peril and actually deal a lot of damage to him with Mega Rush P. I am able to beat him, but mainly because I got lucky more than actually having a good strategy or being able to overpower him with good enough tactics. Rockhawk was not fun. Now, the fight was pretty standard until he grabbed the ceiling, where I can't afford to knock him down with an attacking item and status items wouldn't actually knock him down either. And once he jumped on me, I was basically dead. Really, the only way I was able to win this fight is if I got lucky with Sleepy Sheep putting him to sleep, so there is an RNG involved in this fight. In case you're wondering, Rock Hawk has a max HP of 40. Once his HP drops below 14, and he already executed a Superman Slam, which is basically like a cross chop if you saw it in Stenora's Pokemon attack, that's gonna go for the ceiling. So what you have to do then is use the Sleepy Sheep before you get him to that HP value, and then start charging your attack. Be mindful of Rockhawk's HP and his ego, and strike him when he doesn't expect it. That's how you get the win. Insert joke about Rockhawk here. You <laughs> children. We are now the champions of the Glitz Pit, but that may very well be short-lived as now we have to battle Macho Grubba, the final boss of Chapter 3. And I say final boss because you have Bowser, you have the Dark Koopa Troll, and you have Rockhawk. I think it's a fair assessment to make here. Now this is a fight where not being able to super guard does make it a fair bit harder because Grubba does a lot of damage especially if he soups himself up. It's also more important than ever before that I get the great on the action command for shell shield because otherwise it's not going to protect Mario from more than one hit. At least until he starts charging himself and then it won't really matter but that's only if he does choose to charge himself. If he just tries to power himself up or he just tries to go for defense or evasion then yeah you absolutely do want to hit as much HP in that shell shield as you possibly can muster. Because this is one of those fights where Macho Gubba can hit you really hard, you ideally want to bring at least some kind of healing items with you here. Raw offense just won't be enough, and you can't manipulate your HP when the AI is so erratic here too. Just remember also, don't see if your game after confronting Grubba about the paper with the crystal star about it, or you just might find yourself between a rock and a hard place. Keep in mind that you cannot go back outside the Glitz Pit until you beat the boss of Chapter 3, or at least before you confront him. So. Taken caution. With that taken care of, we now have three crystal stars, leaving only four to go. And no sign of the x knots this time around either. Chapter 4 is underway, and this chapter is really hardly worth being talked too much about, beyond the badge that an invincible shooting star Eve will give you in exchange for giving her a healing item, of which I gave her a dried shroom. There's a defend plus as well, which when combined with all our defense badges that we currently have, gives us a defense of 4 if we successfully guard. Now Dupless. Veterans of Paper Mario will know that Dupless is extremely simple and very easy to beat. There is nothing to fear here. All you need to know is that Dupless has an attack power of 4, meaning that as long as you have all of your defensive badges that you have up to this point equipped, he can't hurt you as long as you guard. Now, Chapter 4 introduces another exception we have to take in for this challenge, as Dupless steals all of our partners, and that includes Koops, leading us to be forced to fight him instead of fighting with him. There's simply no way around this as even if we were able to hack and make Koops playable in this section of the game, the game would crash once we finish the fight with him out. This is because the game by now does not expect you to have any partners so that Vivian would be your only one. So we unfortunately have to skip the rest of chapter 4 and move on to chapter 5. Back in Rogue Port, the damage dodge has caught my eye. Chapter 5 is beginning, and while here, we get the Ice Power Badge, which will improve Mario's defense against fire attacks a bit, as well as protect him from burns if we miss guards. We also snag a P down D up for Mario, which reduces his attack power. Not only that, but it also reduces the attack power of enemies that are aimed at him, giving Mario a whopping 5 defense total when guarding, with 2 of those defense points being impossible to pierce when guarding. There also was this one cute little defend plus P hidden somewhere here which we can also use for Koops. The fight with Cortez, I was genuinely sure it'd be impossible. And I didn't see 
any way we could win. Before talking about why, let's look at this fight and how it plays up to when that actually happens. In Phase 1, damage is potentially non-existent. I can't guard Cortez worth my life, but the math adds up and you can definitely get through it without taking any damage as with Mario on the defense with a single damage dodge and a single defend plus equip, he will take no damage while Koops takes no damage with the partner variants. The second phase where Cortez can charge his attack is more problematic, but you still should never actually die here as while the charge will hurt a lot, you have the attack power with Power Plus Peace equipped to KO him in 5 turns, giving him only 2 turns to attack you. Now Phase 3 is where it becomes problematic. Cortez is now airborne, meaning Koops can't reach him. Naturally, you just use whatever offensive items you can here, but the damage doesn't equate to a KO. Cortez has a max HP of 20, which will reset to full every time you knock him out, beginning a new phase of the fight. The total damage the items we have access to up to this point can deal a whopping 39 damage, which would be enough to KO him for good, but we need to look at this more closely. Of this pool of available items, how many would we even have left? We get a Fire Flower in Rogueport Sewers, which was used on Spike Storm in Chapter 3, two Fire Flowers in Petal Meadows, and two Pal Blocks, which were used both for Spike Storm and the Magic Group of Masters, along with a Mystery so we're currently stuck at like 26 total damage left. We also have two Thunder Rages, an Ice Storm, and a Shooting Star. With all of these items, we indeed can well surpass Cortez's max HP. So what's the problem? Well... Yeah, once his HP falls to 10 or lower, he will consume the souls of the audience which very well will wax his current HP out. I was able to form a sentence about a freaking Pirate King spirit eating the souls of the audience in a Mario game. I freaking love Paper Mario! But yes, because of this mechanic, he effectively has a max 30 HP in his final phase. So the 26 damage we potentially can deal to KO him isn't even enough. Seeing this, I felt like the only way that this fight could even be doable was by super guarding Cortez's head 30 times as it was the only way Koops could finish him off, let alone even touch him. Even though I crafted my rules specifically because I knew this was waiting for me, I couldn't help but be disappointed seeing this was impossible to do. At least, I thought it was impossible, before my friend Warsby King came up with a strategy involving using the Ice Storm's small chance to freeze Cortez and keep him from healing in the middle of his third phase. It was genius. By using the remaining Shooting Star and then the Ice Storm, he'll be frozen with 11 HP remaining. Once he's frozen, you just have to use two Thunder Rages dealing 10 more damage. He will be left with one more HP, but it doesn't end there. Whenever anyone is frozen, they will receive a single point of damage from thawing out meaning we deal just enough damage to KO Cortez in a fight that took significantly less time to complete. As for how I ended up beating Cortez, well, yeah, at the time I thought I had no choice but the Super Guard and sit through all the weapons attacking me too. I ended up getting tossed a boost sheet by the audience, which was also really important for much later in the game. But I was also poisoned by the hook, so I had to make a decision. Did I give up? or use the slow shroom I brought out of fear that this would have happened? Well, the answer was unfortunately rather predictable, but so be it. I beat Cortez, and it was an absolutely brutal fight. But we did successfully pull it off. Though I can't help but be the most disappointed in myself for not thinking to use the Ice Storm in order to hold off on Cortez healing himself. From this point forward, however, I'm going to act as if those items that I did not use for this fight did not exist, and we can probably just make an exception here. On the bright side, at least Lord Krupp was easier. I mean, yeah, there was a nagging feeling of missing a single guard and then being left completely helpless as he continued to body slam me to death, but that never happened. Though as luck would have it, I ran out of FP attacking Lord Krupp because I kept using power shells since I wanted to attack both his x knot and him in the same turn, and I end up not having enough FP for the final phase where he can attack and call them back every time they get knocked out. All of a sudden, the Star Spirits hear my wish and I get an FP bingo, restoring my FP to max, and I can win this fight without any trouble afterwards. Chapter 5 ends, Chapter 6 begins, 
With Barbary as a new partner, we can grab the Ultra Stone, allowing us to rank up Koops with maximum power and learn Shell Slam, which is Power Shell, with twice the FP cost and extra point of damage and defense piercing capabilities. Now, within Chapter 6, we have the boss Smorg, which wasn't awful, but wasn't good either. Like, with all the badges you have available, it's absolutely possible to get past without taking any damage, but I have a really hard time guarding the front Miyazma swipe. Just charge a bunch, deploy a Thunder Rage, and let the damage just bloom. Now, if you're good at guarding this attack, then by all means, just charge until you get the 50 attack, Thunder Rage, and then just win right there. As for me, I charge until I reach like 25 attack, then use my Thunder Rage, then use Shell Toss, and then the Claw came out. And this thing can actually do a lot more damage than the Miasma Swipes can. Those do 5 damage, the Claw does 10. Fortunately, however, Smork does not have infinite defense when the Claw is out. He only has a single point. So from there, I just spam Shell Toss and then Super Guard the Claw and I win just like that. Sorry, not sorry. I admit that I'm not good at this game anymore. Within Poshly Sanctum, I get the L Emblem. And you know why? Because this time, I'm not Mario, I'm Luigi. And now everything makes sense. We win by doing absolutely nothing. It's all coops from here. Penultimate Chapter 7 is starting now. Not much here to be concerned with beyond the Defend Plus badges for Mario and his partner, but you should be wary of the point of no return after finishing the boss here. Any items on the moon you want, now is your last chance to get them. I will concede that I cheated in the fight with the two Elite x knots because the bullies knocked Koops down after hitting him with a stopwatch, but please understand. There is also some feeling fine badges to grab, but I hate fixing stuff, so I instead got them my own way instead. And finally, I hope you keep your eyes peeled for Ultra Shrooms. You're going to need them later. As for the boss of Chapter 7, it's an absolute cakewalk. Equip all the defense plus badges you need, charge for 30 turns, and then attack. And unlike Smorg, I can actually guard this attack consistently, so it was very easy for me to be. But I found that boring, so instead I decided to attack him early and super guard the X punches, because hey, at least by doing that, I had some tension here. Not even the audience cannon is really anything to worry about. That move does literally nothing to Koop because of his defense. All seven crystal stars have been collected now, and we opened the way for the Thousand Year Door below. It's about time. Chapter 8, creatively named the Thousand Year Door. With a ton of footwork underway, we've got a ton of bosses to challenge. We are starting with Dark Bones, who is practically impossible to lose to if you spam Shell Slam. We also get our last badge of note, P of D down P. Through our trek up the Palace of Shadow, we encounter Gloomtail, the brother of Hooktail. His encounter filled me with dread. I was honestly worried that this might be impossible too, even though it was probably less justified than it was for Cortez. Gloomtail is packing a whopping 80 HP and he sports a massive 8 attack, which alone are already really bad traits to have, but it gets even worse. Gloomtail has an attack you can't guard no matter what you try, that move being his bite. No matter what you try, that move will always do 8 damage to you, minus any defense you also have equipped to you. However, the worst move that he has in his arsenal is his Poison Breath, because this move, unlike both the bite and the stump that he can use, pierces my defense. Having just one move that pierces my defense that he can use whenever he wants, including the guaranteed one on the first turn, means that any damage manipulation I want to do has to factor in that piercing attack as well. Those moves aside, Gloomtail has two signature moves that set him apart from Hooktail, being A, his Earthquake attack, which does 10 damage that also pierces, which he can only use at 48 HP or lower, or his Mega Breath, which he will use at 32 HP or lower after he's used his Earthquake attack. What he will do is spend one time to charge, and then the second turn he will let loose a Mega Breath that will do a whopping 16 damage. Needless to say, you do not want to get hit by that which is difficult to avoid because we can't really do enough damage to Gloomtail fast enough to avoid it, so he's basically guaranteed to get it off. Now, as for how I beat Gloomtail, we needed plenty of danger badges, namely my two last stand P's, my Mega Rush P, my Power Plus P, and despite not being active only in danger, also my two Power Plus P's. The plan for this fight revolved completely around those badges as I shell slammed against Gloomtail four times. You'll notice how every attack he uses against me does 7 damage, and that I'm purposefully avoiding guarding his stomp. That's because Koops has a natural defense point, meaning guards with throw by damage calculation, which is necessary because we can't guard the fight anyway, and need to factor that into account. We now deal 10 damage with Shell Slam thanks to Power Rush P, and we fall to 4 HP at the end of our assault. 
but my two last stampedes divide the damage from the 10 damage Earthquake by 3, which when you use this number to divide by 9, makes the Earthquake do only 3 damage, which is perfect for getting us into peril. Unfortunately, pure strategy will only get us this far. Now we have to rely on luck. We need to use a Sleepy Sheep and have it work. If it fails, that's a death and I doubt I have to really explain why that is. If it works, however, it is time to do some setup. So I use a hot sauce, which I got from the businessman in Glitzville, as well as a maple syrup, allowing me to dish out two more shell slams. If the first one wakes up Gloomtail, it's game over, which is nice because Gloomtail did not wake up the first time I attacked him, and now he never will. We're two for two for dead dragons and now skill Riddle Tower. There was also the Shadow Sirens Redux, but I did not even care to try. Like, as soon as my HP got low, I went for Super Guard because I don't care about these three at all. Out of how often Marilyn likes to use Lightning, I really don't think I'm unjustified because I hate relying on luck anyway. Just spam Shell Slam and be done with them. And if for whatever reason you want to question the validity of this challenge still, keep in mind we have plenty of Wackabumps still we never even tried using yet, so those could very easily carry us through this fight. Now then, do you know how I found both Cortez and even Gloomtail at some points to be impossible? That does not even compare to the utter horror I felt to Grotus. Now we've hit the danger zone. Remember how up to this point we've been shooting for consistency where we could? Yeah, not anymore. Strategy is about to take a back seat from here on out. I'm not breaking any of my rules that I've established already though, but you'll see what I mean as we delve into just how toxic this fight really is for this challenge. For starters, see that shield? That's from the Grotus X's circling around him. As long as those four exist, you can't touch him at all. And Koops can't reach not only the ones on top, but also near the floor either. No, I'm serious! You cannot reach any of the Grotus X's with Koops. Don't let appearances fool you. So the only way you can take them out is by using items. There were a bunch of offensive items just in the Palace of Shadow, but you don't want to use them there, trust me. Rather, use your Fire Flower if you save the one like I did. You'll see why soon after, but you want to wait on using your Fire Flower until later in the fight. Because after the Grotus X's are eliminated, Grotus will spawn two more in their place. You'll still be vulnerable, but you better make whatever damage you land count, because it will cost you another item to make him vulnerable again. Now what makes this fight so difficult is that unlike others, where you can get by with good guarding or damage manipulation, this fight doesn't allow for either of those. Grotus himself uses primarily piercing attacks, ranging from his Ice Beam, Thunderbolt, and Heat Wave. The last of which has a visual bug that makes the animation sometimes not align with the sound cue. And if you're a normal person that relies on what you can see on the screen and not the faint sound of fire rolling by, then god dang, you're gonna have even more trouble here. Not to mention that every single attack that Grotus can use against you has different damage output. And after the first turn, Grotus' AI is entirely random, where he will always use the lightning first turn. Not guarding is not an option either, as there is no way to protect Koops from being either burned or frozen as is Mario. Especially when it's impossible to telegraph who Grotus can choose to fire his Ice Beam at, or even if he chooses to use his Ice Beam, so you have to preemptively guard to avoid the possibility of being frozen. As for how I won, well, defense was invalidated by Grotus' attacking properties, so I went out and bought a bunch of HP pluses for Mario and equipped my two HP plus P's for Koops to make them beefier. I also withdrew all of my Ultra Shrooms, as this was a better time than ever to use them as we have no choice but to outright survive and then strike once and hard. Something you'll notice is that by tanking the damage and healing accordingly, this fight is a lot more manageable. It may take a bunch of our resources, but fortunately this is the only fight we have to do this for. Right? Well, no. Unfortunately, the worst has yet to come. Immediately after Grotus, with no opportunity to save, we immediately have to battle Bowser again with Kami freaking Koopa. Strap in, folks. This is going to be one wild ride. So an important thing to note is that Bowser hits a lot harder now. And with his bulky 70 max HP and 2 defense, you're going to have a hard time KOing him. But he isn't a big threat. Kami is. As you can plainly see, she is airborne. So Koops can't reach her without items. What is nice is that items will temporarily force her to the ground for a few turns, meaning you in theory can deal more damage to her before she gets her broom back. And 50 HP isn't too unreasonable to take a boss like her down. So what's the problem? She can heal. 
Whenever her turn rolls around and Bowser's HP is below full, she will sometimes restore 8 HP to Bowser. She can heal herself too, but only when her HP is 30 or less. As you can imagine, spending turns being blanked by Bowser is a waste of time, so you have no choice but to spam charge a ton until you can score a KO. But you simply can't do that. Know also that Kami will also attack you, and she likewise uses defense piercing attacks. With both Bowser and Kami on the offensive, you just don't have the HP to survive even with Ultra Shrooms. In fact, you actively need one of the two to stop attacking you for a while to gain enough time to charge. Even then, your items will only carry you so far, as you just don't have the resources available to you to outlast as Koops. Nor the damage output. The only way that Koops can even compete with Kami Koopa's healing is if he's in danger. Even with that, you're hemorrhaging HP while Bowser is infinitely able to chip you down. Even FP was a problem, as I needed to use Shell Slam for the damage to drop Kami as low as I could without her healing. Not to mention using Shell Shield. Unfortunately, I had no choice but to abuse Wacka. I'm sorry, but it was the only way this could even be remotely possible. By the way, in order for that to be the case, I had to keep retrying Grotus because he can make you lose too many Ultra Shrooms just trying to survive. At most, I can only afford to lose two. Any more than that, I simply can't win. I also needed my stopwatch to keep Kami out of commission for a while so that I could potentially finish her off faster. Otherwise, she can heal herself the instant her HP drops to 25 and rise out of range for Koops to KO her, all the while being in death range for Bowser to finish me off. Listen, there were tons of ways this fight could have and did end up going south. Like how Kami can make herself invisible on one of the two chances I had to attack her, rendering the entire attempt failed. But in my pursuit to turn Koops from a helper to a hero, it happened. The sole circumstance that could save me from what felt like an inevitable disaster. An FP bingo. Solely because this bingo happened, the FP I had was enough to keep Mario alive via Shell Shield. And Koops eventually managed to dethrone Bowser as the King of the Koopas! All of my items were gone. A massive YES was shouted as I stood tall, exposing this foul beast for the fraud he was. The Nightmare was slain. Now before we get to the final boss, I'd just like to say one little thing. If you're interested in seeing more challenges like this, comment down below what partner you'd like to see me try this with next. There's Goombella, Flurry, Yoshi, Vivian, and Bottery. I say Miss Mouse, but Cappy already did one with her, so instead, I will tell you all to check out his run with her in the description down below. If you're a Pokemon fan, however, I've also got a good number of Pokemon challenges on this channel, ranging from Lady Bell to Aeron. Just watch to the end of this video, and the playlist will be on the screen then. Only one boss left. Before we continue to our final battle, I went and restocked on items. I brought the best I could muster, while leaving Waka alone, of course. My badges are here, and my shell is toned. It's time to brave our final battle. The Possessor of Peaches. The Demon of Darkness. The Witch of the New Moon. The Shadow Queen. This fight, unlike any of the previous ones, is much more straightforward, but with a massive 150 HP and ability to heal herself from stealing either my or Mario's HP, she is by no means easy to KO. It also was worth noting that as far as the first phase, she has her first three attacks scripted. If you use Shell Shield turn one on Mario, and then she attacks Mario with her Lightning Bolt, and then after her power lift, she uses another one of her attacks, this time her Hand Dragon Mario's Shell Shield, you can effectively con her out of 21 HP of damage. But that's the extent of strategy that I can think of. And even that is luck-based, because if she doesn't cooperate, she can just attack whoever she wants. That bonus boost sheet that I also got from the Battle of Cortez finally comes into play here too, because I needed to be able to survive against the second part of the first phase where she becomes invincible. Minimizing damage this entire fight is mission critical, especially when you're taking three hits at a time every turn which you can't do anything about. All you can really do is Shell Slam or Power Shell as much as you need to, which fortunately will also be enough to fall her left and right hands, which for some reason can be hit by either Shell Slam or Power Shell, but not the freaking Grotus X's. There's a problem here, can you see it? 
Regardless, because of how this fight functions, you can potentially leave her with only one attack for her whole turn. Leaving the left and right hands after the turn when she first switches them in will almost guarantee your death. Give her as few opportunities to heal from you as possible. As for the Dark Pulse she can do when she charges, keep your wits about you and keep your HP at a safe level, or hopefully you burn only a single life stream to revive both Koops and Mario. For the true final battle, you do have to worry about it turn 3, but you have a scripted Shine Sprite bingo to help you here, so don't fret over taking any damage. Get that bingo lined up, miss action commands if you need to keep that bingo there for a later time, and when your HP is low or for whatever reason your FP is too low, let that bingo rip and then throw all you can at her as best as you can. After a long, agonizing struggle where Koops was a single hit away from death, we got the better of the Shadow Queen, ending the challenge once and for all. Awesome. Thank you so much for watching this video to the very end. You are an absolute legend. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like, and if you're interested in challenge runs for more Paper Mario games, consider joining the Glitch Pit Discord server, which I will share in the description of this video. I'll see you next time, and with that, the show's over. That's a wrap.